Hey everybody, Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well today. Look what I've got in here. It's a Denifrips Pontus II ladder deck, R to R ladder deck. It's really cool. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you sit back, get comfortable, and we'll talk about the Pontus II. Well, as many of you know, the Pontus II is a true resistor R to R ladder deck configuration. It is quite remarkable. Now, I am going to apologize up front. I had to make some notes. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to cover on this, and I want to make sure I get the techie part right. And I don't have the best memory in the world, so, uh, and I'd appreciate it. But I would like to remind you that if you like the video, please give me a like and a subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel, there are a couple ways you can do that. One is there is a membership link in the description of the video and the pinned comment. And also on my YouTube home page, there is a join button if you wish, but you gotta be on a browser, not on an iPad or an Android tablet, just so you know. Also too, if you feel like buying me a granola bar, there's a thank you button down at the bottom. Please don't feel obligated to do any of that. It just helps support the channel. And again, I have some costs involved with shipping and receiving and things like that. And it just helps to defray those costs. So thank you very much in advance. Anyway, again, I apologize for reading from a script, but Denifrips uses a four ladder array of 0.01% uh, resistors and they're very thermally stable resistors and that's important because apparently heat is generated during the digital to analog conversion process through an, a ladder DAC. So very good and to quote them they say it has the design has small linear error, high decoding speed, low digital noise. So it, the low digital noise, low distortion, they're referring to noise floor. Now, when we talk a lot about noise in audio circuitry, we're not talking about anything that's normally just like stands out hitching the face like scratchiness or buzz or distortion of some sort you know fuzzy sound what it does do is it raises the noise floor of the unit of, of and raising the noise floor masks very fine detail very low level signals get lost in that in the noise floor so having a good low noise floor and i will put whatever the noise floor rating is here the lower the noise floor the better those fine nuanced details that we're all craving and wanted to hear are revealed to us and that's very important so it's very low noise one of the cool things though is it uses an adaptive fifo buffering circuitry and it's a reclocking circuitry so fifo means first in first out and so there's a memory buffer that takes the incoming signal and it this is from spdif inputs now if, if you saw the video i did on don't chase the dac chip i talked about that a spit of connection to this means that the device that's sending that signal, it's that clock that's determining the timing, not the internal clock in the device. And with spit if there's always going to be timing issues and there's always going to be jitter issues. So if you're relying on the external clock, let's say I got a 25 year old CD player. How good is the clock in that going to be? It's going to be 25 year old, 25 years old, good and old technology. Good. So not good. The FIFO adaptive buffering in this, or reclocking in this, means that as the spit of signals are coming in, they're held in a memory buffer, and then a really high precision, low phase noise femto clock then takes that digital signal and reclocks it accurately before it ever gets to the DAC section of the unit for decoding. So again, that means that jitter's reduced. Now, how does jitter manifest itself? How do these timing issues manifest themselves? Well, in my experience and from what I, have heard myself, it manifests itself more in the mid range. So let's say you've got a complex orchestral piece where there's a lot of instruments playing at the same time. When there's a lot of jitter and there's a lot of timing issues that all of those instruments playing at the same time just sounds like a mash, like a hash. It's hard to pick out individual instruments and follow them. It sounds confusing and congested. When you have really good timing and low jitter, it's that you can then pull individual instruments out of that assemblage of noise and listen to them individually. And that's really important. At least it's very important to me is that clarity because that that congestion can have a strident sound to it. it can sound annoying. It can be fatiguing to listen to. So good clock timing and jitter reduction is really, really important. And that's why a lot of people talk about, um, you know, and a lot of companies invest a lot of money in developing, you know, good uh, reclocking issues. And that's why people want to use outboard reclockers with things too. So anyway, the adaptive FIFO buffer reclocking, I think is really, really important in that the sound of this in those kinds of circumstances was absolutely clean and you could pull out the individual instruments. 
It does have a state-of-the-art USB interface. Now, again, in that video I was referring about DAX, we, I talked about USB. USB is an asynchronous connection, which means it's bi-directional, um, which means then that the clock in this sets the timing, not the sending device. So USB is the best because if this detects missing packets, it can request back to the sending device that those packets get resent so that everything can be properly assembled and timed and sent out. Uh, you know, all of that's done before it gets to the DAC section. So that's really important. Now, I squared S, and it does have I squared S connection. It doesn't matter because that's the actual machine language. So there are virtually zero issues and perfect timing and all of that other stuff. It does use a, uh, the, and the USB interface it uses is actually really good. And it's a, a similar to what a number of really high-end companies use. It's based on an Amonero module. And USB, um, they can, you can bring it in on this with this, with the proprietary firmware software that Denifrips has developed for the Amonero USB chip. We can run this at 24-bit up to 1536 kilohertz. Pretty amazing. And DSD up to 1024. So if there's ever a signal out there that that's high, you can do it. Now, it is um, interesting in that they also have it set up so if there's no USB signal de detected, the USB circuitry shuts off. Again, just reducing any uh, possibility of additional noise being introduced into those sensitive decoding circuitries. So that's, I think, a really nice feature. And a couple other manufacturers do it, but it's, it's high-end stuff for sure. Now, it does use a proprietary SPDIF digital audio receiver. And again, like I mentioned, there's always timing and jitter issues in SPDIF. So this uses an, uh, on the optical, coax, and ASEVU, which are all SPDIF. Uh, it does use an FPGA, a field programmable gate array. And a field, field programmable gate array is basically a microprocessor circuitry that can be programmed to do a lot of different things. If you remember my little FIO K11 R to R DAC, uh, that uses an FPGA to convert DSD to PCM to decode it. Uh, I think Paul McGowan at PS Audio, I think they use FPGAs programmed to be actual DACs. Um, so they can do a lot of different things. What Denifrips does is they use the FPGA to be the um, oversampling uh, and jitter reduction and digital, digital uh, noise shaping and everything else on the SPDIF input. So while the maximum SPDIF input it can take and output without oversampling is 24192, which is very common, because of this uh, FPGA, we can upsample PCM to 1411.2 kilohertz. I don't know why, but you can. Anyway, uh, it does have oversampling, non-oversampling modes. Um, when I plugged it into Artivana, Artivana detects that this is a plays with Artivana approved device. And so it automatically wants to set the settings in, in, internally in Artivana to what Denifrips uh, recommends, which then means this thing's running at full tilt boogie at 1536 kilohertz. I didn't really care for the oversampling modes, even the, the optional oversampling mode on the front. Um, I just ran it standard at 1644. I'm a red book kind of guy anyway. If it is, if there's 2496, it'll do that obviously. 24192, it'll do that obviously. But I didn't, I didn't run it oversampling uh, through Artivana and I thought it was just wonderful. So it really is kind of good. Now it does have an oversampling mode, non-oversampling mode button option. And I found that the non-oversampling mode with the slow filter on was my preference. It has a fast filter, fast linear, and a slow filter. And then it has an oversampling mode, which takes everything to 1536 on USB or 1411.2 uh, on uh, PCM input or uh, SPDIF input. So it does have that. Now, let's spin it around and take a look at the backside. Bear with me a second while I power it off and make disconnect some stuff back here. It is a solid chunk of aluminum, I'm telling you. Uh, by the way, it has three feet, so it's always balanced like a milkmaid's stool. I don't know why I made that reference. I'm going to start out on this end. Balanced out, RC, single-ended on RCA, very high-quality connectors. AC power socket. SPDIF coax on RCA, SPDIF coax on BNC, and BNC is a twist lock connector. ASEBU on XLR. And again, this is a SPDIF connection. TOSLink, uh, regular conventional TOSLink, again, SPDIF. I squared S, which is really interesting. Um, and I'm not sure on I squared S pin configurations and all that. It's in the owner's manual, and there's lots of information online about it. And USB-B. And I mostly used it TOSLink and USB-B. So let's spin it back around and we'll talk about the sound quality. Oh. 
Oh, it's a beast. So how'd it sound? Well, let me tell you how I used it, just so you can get an idea. I did run this balanced out, USB out from my PC running Artivana. Uh, I ran balanced out into the Cambridge Evo 150 and then used the Evo 150 as the amp and everything else and listened to it that way. I then, because I could run balanced into the Evo, I ran the Evo as a preamp and I went line level out to an Adcom GFA 545 to a Thomas and Stereo uh, Galleon TSA75, which I've got into for review. I also ran it out into um, my Marantz integrated amp, and I ran it out to one of the old classic receivers I had here just for giggles. It was okay. Um, there were some limitations, obviously, with the vintage gear. How I listened to it most of the time. Most of the time I ran uh, line level out of, from the system, not going through any preamp, and I ran it into a Sparkos Gemini headphone tube-based headphone amplifier, which also has, acts as a preamplifier, running into single-ended into the Galleon A75. And I got to tell you, that was a magic combination. So really, really good. I used my big Wharfdales. I used the little Wharfdale 225s I have in visiting. I used the ELAC DBR62s. I used my energy reference. I used the Monitor Audio Silver 100s. Um, I even brought the ELAC uh, debut 2.0 F62s back in for a listen. So I threw everything I had at it. I also listened to it through the Cambridge AXR100 and through the Cambridge CXA81 Mark II, which I have in review, review coming soon. Again, threw everything at it. So. To me, the best combination, uh, just the most rewarding combination, all of them were great, but I thought the little Gemini tube preamp running into the Galleon A75 just had a sweetness and a, and a detail and a delicacy to it that I really, really enjoyed um, running into the big Wharfdales. Um, it was just magic. And so, and again, I ran it in non-oversampling mode with the slow filter on. It was remarkable. This is an amazing product. And the nice thing is, being uh, a couple of generations old, there are used ones out on the market now. So if you're interested in doing something like this, I think used to be a really good way to go. They have a good reputation for reliability as well. Plus, I think there are also ways to upgrade the firmware in it. I'm not sure. Anyway, if there is, I'll put something down here. So as I listen to it, um, the best advertisement I can give for this thing is I would sit back and I'd put on some really, really good music like this. And it allowed me to, I just, I stopped trying to analyze what it sounded like and just enjoyed the music and just listened for the sake of listening. And I'm not sure that there, I could give a product a better advertisement for that. There are a few and I have, I own a couple that allow me to just sit back and listen and enjoy. So in the base, now this is just an observation I made based on having this in and also having an AudioLab MDAC, which there is a review I've done for that. I don't know if you've seen it yet or if it's coming after this. I don't always release re the reviews, the videos in the sequence that I recorded them. But that MDAC is actually quite good as well and it's very comparable in price to this. Um, listening to those two and listening to R2R to R versus a very high-end ESS based DAC, the MDAC, I think a lot of DACs, um, not the MDAC, but I think a lot of DACs under the $750 price point and maybe some of the topping and SMSL stuff, I think they have a bit of an elevated bass response because I think there's a lot of people like that. I do. I like a little more bass than not enough bass. I'd rather have extra than, than be thin on that. But what the Pontus 2 showed me is that maybe they are just artificially elevated bass and it's not really true deep bass response. And here's why. I was listening to some organ music, you'll see the album cover up here, that has a fundamental, it's a huge pipe organ in Europe, and it has a fundamental pipe at 16 hertz. Now, my system can't, if I'm 30 feet away, I can probably get that 16 hertz note, but my system will get into the mid to low 20s pretty normally. And this thing resolved all of that detail down there. And I could see on the spectrum analyzer, it was doing 16 Hertz. It, I mean, it, there was information down there. Obviously it was way down on the, you know, probably 15, 20 dB down, but it was there. So this could resolve that. And what made me think is this gave me 
a really natural bass response. Deep, extended, nuanced, textured. You could you could follow the the the, the bass notes. It imaged well, but it was just really natural, not elevated in any way. And I kind of appreciated it. So it was a little bit of a revelation there. So all through the bass was just fabulous, very well detailed. Mid bass, excellent, fast, and bass fast, good attack. Uh, you know, really good uh, transients, you know, especially snare, you know, rim shots, things like that, electric guitar in the mid-range, very fast, very articulate, and really nuanced and, and detailed. And again, great imaging in that area as well. Male vocals were wonderful. Uh, female vocals were absolutely excellent. Zero sibilance. Uh, cymbal crashes, there, were, there was no splashiness to the cymbal crashes. Uh, it was just really, really normal uh, and natural sounding, which I really appreciated. If there's a little something, there might be a, just a little bit of thinness just where we start crossing from the mid-range into the upper mid-range. But boy, I had to really concentrate to try to hear it. And I'm not sure I wasn't imagining it. Um, so it was that good. As you get into the upper mid-range, you know, you get up in the higher registers of a piano, even if you're standing in front of the piano and listening to it without amplification or anything else, you get into those upper registers, it can get strident sounding, it can get bright sounding. I mean, that's where that area of the piano lives in that two to four to 5,000 uh, hertz range. And all, many of us are sensitive to too much energy in that range. This didn't add any energy. If the piano was gonna sound strident, if I'm standing in front of it, it sounded right through this. So no added silliness. There was no, this is low fat, no added fat kind of a thing. Just what you, what was going in was what you were getting out. And I really appreciate that. You get in the upper frequencies, the sense of air, the sense of space, the, the decay of notes and transients was just wonderful and natural. Um, it threw a really wonderful image, very wide, very nice, large image, great locked laser focus center image. But where it really was interesting is in the depth of the image. It, and I'll be honest with you, was not the absolute deepest I've ever heard, but it was close. And I'm not sure if that's the associated equipment, but it was as deep as almost anything I've ever heard. So it was just so rewarding, especially on orchestral pieces like the one here. Um, it was just really natural and really wonderful. So. It is a great piece. I highly recommend it. And again, because they've been out for a while, there are a bunch of used ones out there, I think on eBay, maybe Facebook Marketplace, certainly Audiogon. Um, and if you're interested in getting an RR deck and you want to get really high performance but not spend a lot of money, boy, a used one of these uh, might be really worth considering. And um, I have not heard this side by side with the latest version of the Yaris or the new Enyo product. So I couldn't tell you if it sounds better, but my guess is it probably does um, based on, uh, you know, anecdotal uh, uh, you know, information I've gotten from other folks. So great piece, highly recommended. Anyway, I hope you liked the video. If you did, please give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel, again, there's a link in the description and pinned comment if you want to join the channel. I would appreciate that. Members get early access to the videos. And obviously, I have some other uh, planned benefits for uh, members of the channel coming up, you know, product drawings and giveaways and things like that. We're still a ways off on it, just so you know. But also, too, if you want to buy me a granola bar, there's a thank you button in the bottom of the video. In the description of the video are the Amazon affiliate links and everything. You know the drill on those. There's playlists. You guys have been wonderful about sending me playlists. I really appreciate it. There are somewhere close to 25 playlists in the community post. Um, and I would uh, I would heartily encourage you to go listen to them. There's some wonderful stuff that our, you know, all of our uh, my viewers and our fellow viewers and fellow channel people have sent in. And it's really, really wonderful. And again, I would love to get some more uh, playlist from my international viewers just to get a sense of what you guys are listening to over there. So anyway, that's pretty much done. I really like this thing. I'm going to be sad to have to give it back. And thank you to Mr. I Cipher for letting me borrow it. Anyway, this is Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel saying now it's time for you to go listen to some music, maybe on a really nice DAC in a really good system. Thank you so very much for your time.